So I've been wanting to uh, do something on how uh, philosophy can be useful for more practical matters, you know, not just talking about metaphysics and the problems of universals. Um, I've been wanting to do something like that for quite some time. And this seems like a pretty w useful way to do that because there's a thing that's uh, pretty well accepted in philosophy called abduction, or more commonly called, known as inference to the best explanation. And it's very useful for dealing with issues that are kind of hard to deal with through other methods of reasoning or where there's a lot of uncertainty. And so I'm going to apply that to what we're, what's going on in Brett Kavanaugh's confirmation hearings, what we've learned about that, and see what we can learn from it. Now, inference to the best explanation is very well accepted by philosophers. Some of the specifics of it are a little bit debated, but the broad strokes of it are very well accepted by pretty much everybody. So, like, if you're ever at a philosophy conference and you use inference to the best explanation, nobody's going to tell you you can't do that. You might be told you're using it improperly or it doesn't apply here, but nobody's going to say that's a bad method of reasoning, what are you doing? So, this is a third type of reasoning. You usually hear about deduction, which is, you know, um, if A, then B, A, so B. Or there's induction, which is if A, then B, probably A, so probably B. Well, abduction, or inference to the best explanation, is a little bit of a different animal. Now, it's actually something that all of us use in our everyday reasoning all the time. So an easy example is, say a jury is trying to determine if the defendant's guilty. Now, what they're really attempting to do is say, is the prosecutor's explanation that the defendant committed the crime more likely or is the defense explanation that the defendant is innocent more likely? Which uh, explanation better fits the facts? And that's a very simple explanation of uh, inference to the best explanation. Or for another simple example, let's suppose you wanted to know why your friend Brett is angry at your other friend Diane. Well, if you hear from someone else that the two of them had a fight, you'd probably conclude that the fight is a good explanation for Brett's anger. After all, that's a better explanation than something like aliens manipulating Brett's brain or supposing that Brett is just angry for no reason. Now, you probably don't think about it quite that formally when you're doing these kind of th this kind of reasoning, but at a basic level, that's all inference to the best explanation is, and all of us do it all the time every day. Now, the reason why it's useful to do this type of reasoning in a much more formal sense is that enables us to see and explain things that we couldn't do otherwise. Just as a runner who really puts in time training and gets good equipment can run better than someone who doesn't train and has poor equipment, so doing formal analysis with IBE can show us things that might otherwise escape us. So um, I'm basing some of this on what the philosopher at Wayne State University, Bruce Russell, said at a conference on epistemology in St. Louis last year. He gave an essay on the whole concept of inference to the best explanation, and he laid out some of the criteria for what a good explanation is. And in the description, I'll link to an article Russell wrote on various types of reasoning, as well as the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy's article on, abdu on abduction. Obviously, the Stanford one is uh, much more in-depth and technical, and Russell's one is a uh, little bit more for people who aren't reading philosophy all the time. So Russell developed this acronym BUMFIS to uh, as an abbreviation for his criteria. They are the background, unification, mechanism, precision, fruitfulness, elegance, scope, and simplicity. Now, background is essentially, does it line up with the background facts we have? Unification is, is it unified with other facts? Mechanism is more or less, what's the mechanism of it? Does it adhere to other mechanisms? Precision is how precise it is. Um, generally speaking, precise theories are better than uh, vague ones, just as how uh, precision engineering is better than sloppy engineering. Fruitfulness is just how fruitful is the theory, do we get good results from it. Elegance is a little bit more subjective, but is it an elegant theory? Scope is the scope of what it explains, and simplicity is how simple it is. Generally speaking, you want to prefer a simple theory to a complex one. And also, I'll be making use of two other things here. These aren't strictly uh, related to inference to the best explanation, but they're just good principles in reasoning in general. The first is what I'm calling the principle of charity, and loosely that's as long as you don't have reasons or evidence in favor of 
one option given the choice between a malicious explanation and the neutral or virtuous explanation of someone's actions, pick the neutral or the virtuous explanation. Give people the benefit of the doubt unless you have a good reason not to. And in a similar sense, we do need to make use of a principle that Richard Swinburne calls here the principle of testimony. And loosely speaking, that's if you don't have good reason to doubt them, just believe what people tell you. And I think I should add, especially given what we're dealing with in this presentation here, is I don't think what this me principle means we should always assume everyone's telling us the truth all the time. It means that you should assume people are telling you what they believe to be the truth. Just because someone told you something that was wrong doesn't necessarily mean he lied to you. People can just be mistaken, as I'm sure many people are going to think I am about many things I say here. So what we want to determine here is what theory or combination of theories best explain all the facts, and that's what inference to the best explanation is. So to uh, simplify a little bit from what uh, Bruce Russell's uh, criteria were, we're looking for something that fits all the available facts, has a good explanatory power and explanatory scope, meaning it has the power to explain the facts, it explains all the facts and everything that we ex would see and expect to see it doesn't leave us expecting more evidence or facts than there are, i.e. some theories, if they're true, they w predict that there would be more facts and evidence than the, what there is. And a good example of this is conspiracy theories. Almost every time there's a conspiracy theory, there's missing data. That is, to prove a conspiracy, there usually had to be people who did a whole number of things and there's no evidence of that. Look at 9-11 conspiracies, conspiracies involving uh, JFK's assassination for good examples almost all of those always predict that there's going to be more evidence and we don't see it and that's part of the reason why they're not good theories additionally a good theory is not ad hoc ad hoc is latin it means for this it's a type of fallacy in some circumstances it literally means you're just making it up it's a just so story so the best example of that is you know when i was playing with my brothers when we were kids they'd hold up the gun and say i shot you and then i'd say but i have a bulletproof vest my bulletproof vest was an ad hoc answer, and we want to avoid theories that are ad hoc for obvious reasons. We want simple theories, so not necessarily ones that are the simplest in the sense of they have no parts, but just ones that aren't needlessly complicated. Occam's razor doesn't actually say the simplest theory is correct. It says don't multiply causality beyond necessity. Don't have more causes in place than needed. If your theory only requires one person to be at a certain place at a certain time, don't then postulate that there are four people there, because it's not needed. And finally, it's going to be plausible. It's uh, not incoherent in the sense of being self-contradictory, and it won't deviate in gross and wide ways from well-established or potential possibilities. So a uh, good and easy example of this is... Every sane person would agree that the X-Men absolutely did not cause 9-11. That's uh, not plausible in any sense whatsoever. Here's the established facts that we have to explain. And I'm going to try to run through them quickly because this will get rather boring because most of you probably already know most of these. First, Dr. Ford accused Brett Kavanaugh of attempting to rape her in 1982. Second, Judge Kavanaugh denies this. Third, Dr. Ford claims there was a gathering or party in the summer of 1982. At least four people were present, including Kavanaugh. According to Dr. Ford, a drunk Kavanaugh and or Mark Judge pushed her into a room and unsuccessfully attempted to rape her. She then left without telling anyone. She does not know when exactly this event occurred, where exactly it happened, how she got to the house, or how she got home afterwards. And there are more details. You can read her accounts or find the letter she sent to Senator Feinstein online. There were three witnesses Dr. Foran named, one of whom is a longtime friend of hers, and all have denied any knowledge of this event. And importantly, Dr. Ford, Judge Kavanaugh, and all the other witnesses have made all their claims under oath, under penalty of perjury. Dr. Ford first mentioned this event to a therapist in 2012. Well, I should say that's the first record we have of her mentioning it to anybody, and that's the first time she claimed she mentioned it to anybody. Now, some details of Dr. Ford's account have changed as she's told her story. And for more on that, I'd refer you to the memo that Rachel Mitchell wrote. She was the one who questioned Dr. Ford at the uh, hearing. I'll just give you a few broad details of that here. Dr. Ford didn't offer a consistent account of when that happened. When she first contacted the Washington Post, she said it happened in the mid-80s. 
In her July 30th letter to Senator Feinstein, she said it happened in the early 80s. In the August, in the statement she made to her polygrapher, she said it happened in high school in the summer of the early 80s. Then uh, an article in the Washington Post says claims she said it happened in the summer of 1982. However, the therapy notes from that therapy session in 2012 state it happened in her late teens, which is not 15. Furthermore, she uh, didn't. She struggled to name Judge Kavanaugh as the assailant by name. No name was given in the 2012 therapy notes. No name was given in 2013 therapy notes. Additionally, uh, Dr. Ford testified that she told her husband about a, quote, sexual assault before they were married, but she told the Washington Post she'd inform, informed her husband that she was a victim of physical abuse at the beginning of her marriage. And also, she didn't offer a consistent account of the assault, that according to her letter to Senator Feinstein, she heard uh, Kavanaugh and Mark Judge talking to partygoers, but according to her testimony to the Senate, she didn't hear them talking to anyone. And her story's been inconsistent about the amount of people that were there. According to the Washington Post's account of her therapy notes, there were four boys in the bedroom when she was assaulted. But she'd also told the Washington Post that the notes were erroneous and there were four boys at the party, but only two in the bedroom. In her letter to Senator Feinstein, she said, me and four others. Then in her testimony, she said there were four boys in addition to her friend and Dr. Ford herself. However, some details have been consistent. You know, she's consistently maintained that something happened to her. And there's details like the fact that she claims she had one beer and that she was wearing a swimsuit under her clothes and things like that that don't seem to have changed. In July 2018, Dr. Ford sent a letter describing this incident to Senator Feinstein by way of Representative Eshu. I hope I'm not mispronouncing that. She described the incident, asked for confidentiality, and then made herself available for further questioning to Senator Feinstein. She also contacted the Washington Post through a tip line and provided some details of the event, including Kavanaugh's name. Sometime between July 30th and August 7th, Senator Feinstein's office recommended Dr. Ford hire the attorney, Deborah Katz. De Dr. Ford also employed attorney Michael Bromwich. Then at the advice of her attorneys, on or about August 7th, Dr. Ford took a polygraph test that was administered by a former FBI agent. She was read a summary of her account and asked if it was accurate. She claimed it was, and then the polygraph indicated that it was highly unlikely she was lying. I think the odds were like 0.02% or something very minuscule like that. At the same time, some Democrats called Kavanaugh evil, and many said his hearing should be delayed, both before and after Dr. Ford's allegations came to light. There were both public and private hearings on Judge Kavanaugh's nomination by the Senate that totaled dozens of hours more. I don't recall the exact amount, but I think it was well more than 30. On September 12th, after the scheduled hearings were, are completed, the existence of Dr. Ford's letter to Senator Feinstein is leaked to the press. Then on September 13th, Senator Feinstein confirms the existence of the letter, but refuses to provide any more details. About the same time, September 13th, Senator Feinstein referred Dr. Ford's letter to the FBI. Then the press manages to figure out who Dr. Ford is, and so on September 16th, she gives an account of her story to the Washington Post. Judge Kavanaugh almost immediately denies Dr. Ford's allegations. Then there's general levels of chaos in reporting about all this for a week and a half. It generally seemed like the stories were changing on a hourly basis. It was reported, among other things, that Dr. Ford was terrified of coming forward, that she had a fear of flying so she couldn't go to Washington, that she or her attorneys demanded things like Judge Kavanaugh testify first instead of going second to respond to her allegations, and many other seemingly bizarre and unusual things. Now, Republicans did tell Dr. Ford's attorneys that they could come to California to interview her, uh, but that did not happen. About 10 days later, on September 27th, both Dr. Ford and Judge Kavanaugh testified before the Senate, and they both affirmed their stories under penalty of perjury. Judge Kavanaugh did admit to drinking beer as a teenager, and then he supplied a personal calendar from 1982, which he claims demonstrates he could not have been at an event like Dr. Ford describes. Dr. Ford testified that she did travel by flight, and that she was unaware of the fact that the Republicans on the Senate Judiciary Committee had offered to interview her in California. And now, uh, an additional point here is that some Democrats have publicly said that they want to delay Kavanaugh's hearings past no the November elections in the hopes that they will take control of the Senate and be able to permanently block his nomination. So now, on to some background or context facts. These are things that aren't really specific to the hearings, but are pretty well-established facts that are 
seem relevant. First, people do lie, but usually only when they have a reason to. Unless you're dealing with someone like a psychopath, people are only going to lie when they think it's in their self-interest and they think they can get away with it. There's a few exceptions, but generally speaking, n people aren't going to lie without a reason. People are less likely to lie under oath due to the penalty of doing so. That's the whole point of perjury and putting somebody under oath. Now, it still happens that people lie under oath, but generally speaking, we can probably trust testimony that's given under penalty of perjury more than we can trust other testimony. Thirdly, serial liars are usually easy to spot given time. And I've got a little story about this. Back when I was in my uh, advanced individual training for the Army, we had a guy in our unit who was trained with us called Smith. And Smith really, really liked to tell stories. He was from Alaska and claimed that he was in gangs and that he had been in a military reform school for teenagers and uh, many other things. In fact, he told so many stories I can't remember them all. But the point is, he was lying, and eventually we realized that, because eventually his stories contradicted each other, and he couldn't keep track of them all. And so eventually we came up with the idea that if somebody's just telling an outlandish story, they're telling a smith. That's what we called it the whole time we were in that uh, segment of training. Telling a smith is just telling an outlandish story where you're lying. Fourth, women do fail to report crimes, even very serious ones, sometimes for years, and this has been, that's been pretty well documented. Also, men have been falsely accused of sexual crimes, and that's also been pretty well documented. Now, it's rare, but not unheard of, for a crime to occur where all the witnesses deny it happened. That's unusual, but it also has happened. It's also very rare for a third person to be present during a sexual assault, and I've only learned that in uh, reading about this particular case. Sexual predators typically assault many people over a long period of time, and if you just stop and think about the people who've been uh, caught up in this recently, like Bill Cosby, Harvey Weinstein, uh, Kevin Spacey, and many others, you see that. It's not just one person, one time, in one place. There's a pattern of behavior that emerges over a long period of time, and you usually have many people coming forward telling very similar stories. Now, human memory is fallible, and sometimes, for any number of reasons, people do misremember things. Just because you remember it doesn't necessarily mean it happened. And if you don't believe me, go get married and your spouse is going to tell you all the things you've forgotten, or get wrong. Lastly here, certainty is not a sign of veracity. Just because somebody is dead certain of something doesn't mean they are right. You can be dead certain and still be wrong. Now, here's a few subjective facts, i.e. my interpretation of a few things. I think there was a pretty continuous will she or won't she about Dr. Ford testifying during the 10-day period before the hearings, and that was a large part of that chaos in reporting I talked about earlier. I found both Dr. Ford and Judge Kavanaugh to be quite compelling witnesses who seemed to be telling the truth as best as they know it. Dr. Ford acted and reacted exactly like a woman in her position probably would, and Judge Kavanaugh displayed the anger or righteous indignation that a man falsely accused and smeared for horribly for a week and a half probably would. He was far more restrained than I think I would have been in that situation. Now, some initial conclusions here before I get onto the theories. Judge Kavanaugh's calendar is evidence, but it's rather weak evidence. A personal record of whereabouts and activities, he could easily fake that, and it probably, we know it isn't exhaustive. He admitted that it doesn't record him going to church, but that he did go to church. However, weak evidence is still better than no evidence. It's like when I was in college, uh, some of the people I hung out with thought that bad pizza is better than no pizza. Now, they were wrong about that, but that's another story. Now, other than her own testimony, there really is no evidence in favor of Dr. Ford's allegations. The fact that she testified under oath makes her allegations much stronger, and that gives us very good cause to think that she really believes what she's saying, but we do pretty much only have her word for it. The fact that the witnesses Dr. Ford mentioned all deny the event is, I would say, significant to strong evidence against her account. And this is compounded by the fact that one of the witnesses is her friend. Her friend would have reason to lie for and support Dr. Ford's account. But that's not what happened. Hence, that gives us good reason to believe the denial of Dr. Ford's friend. I think the polygraph can, at best, only demonstrate that Dr. Ford believes what she is saying. Polygraphs are not lie detectors, and they are not admissible in court because it's been proved that they are unreliable. And further, the circumstances under which the polygraph administered make it a bit suspect, and you can uh, look at uh, Prosecutor Mitchell's uh, report for some more details on that. So, here, there are two main theories. 
The first is that Judge Kavan is guilty. The second is that he is innocent. Now, the main reason why this is interesting and why inference to the best explanation can help us here is that both of these theories have major problems and don't fit all the facts very well. If one, then why do all the other witnesses, including the good friends of Dr. Ford's, deny this happened? Why is there no evidence or witnesses other than Dr. Ford? From her account, somebody must have taken her to the party, somebody must have taken her home. But there's no evidence of that. There's no evidence at all of any of these things, and that's highly unusual for any for some kind of an event to leave no evidence at all. Why is Dr. Ford's account problematic? Why are there the inconsistencies that I mentioned earlier? Under questioning in the Senate, she couldn't remember some very basic things, like whether or not the uh, polygraph she took was administered on the day of her grandma's f funeral or not. And there's many other things like that, which you, you think she would be able to remember, even very recent things that she does not. So. With Dr. Ford's account, what you have is a compilation of possible but very unlikely details, and that is, yes, it's possible that she didn't say anything to anybody about this for 30 years, but that's a little unlikely. Again, that happens, but 30 years is stretching it a bit. And it's possible that it could have happened with all of the witnesses denying it, but again, that's stretching it. It's possible it could have happened with her forgetting where it was, when it was, how she got there, how she got home, but again, that's unlikely. And when you string them all together, each thing in her account is possible, but unlikely. And so you have a combination of a lot, large number of very unlikely details. Further, her actions, I think, before and after the allegation are kind of odd and co perhaps contradictory. Why did she go to the Senate about this instead of police or re other relevant authorities? Why did she take a polygraph if she wanted anonymity? And now I do think this point is going, is perhaps a bit weak as it's kind of difficult to judge someone else's actions. People don't always do things that make sense to us, and that doesn't mean they're not telling the truth, but it's still worth pointing out. Further, uh, sex offenders rarely do so only once, but we don't have even one remotely credible account of Judge Kavanaugh ever doing the same thing. Now, some other stories have come forth since uh, Dr. Ford made her allegations, but those are absolutely ridiculous and easily refuted. Dr. Ford's account is the only one that even approaches being credible and the only one that sh we should take seriously. At least as of the time I'm recording this, you know. Another year goes by, who knows what's going to happen. Further, Judge Kavanaugh has been through multiple background checks. I believe it's six background checks by the FBI, and they didn't find anything. And it's really unlikely that other such events would remain hidden when people are looking into them that deeply for that long. Also, there is great incentive, thanks to how the politics of all this is playing out, for other victims to come forward. But we still don't have one remotely credible accusation. The fact that there are very uncredible accusations points to what the great incentive to come forward, but we still don't have them. So if you want to say Kavanaugh's guilty, then you have to find some way of explaining away all these problems. And that's very difficult to do. Further, um, if you want to say that he's innocent, then you have problems as well. Why would Dr. Ford accuse him? She seems to have nothing to gain by it, and by most accounts of what we've heard, her, this has had a pretty negative effect on her life. So why should she do that? And again, as I've mentioned earlier, people usually don't lie if it goes against their self-interest, and it's very hard to see how her accusing him is in her self-interest. In fact, it seems to go against her self-interest to accuse Judge Kavanaugh, and that's usually a sign that you can believe that people really believe what they're telling you. They're being truthful as best as they can when they're speaking against their own self-interests. And why would Dr. Ford pin the crime on Judge Kavanaugh as opposed to someone else? Well, some details of her story have changed and evolved. Others have remained consistent. And although, again, some details have changed, I don't see signs here that she's lying or a liar. I don't think she's telling a Smith. It seems more like her story's evolving, which is not what Smith did when we were in the army. He just made crap up, and it really doesn't seem like Dr. Ford is just making crap up. Now, passing the polygraph may indicate she's being truthful, but as I indicated earlier, I think this is kind of a weak point for the reasons I cited above. Witnesses do give conflicting accounts. That does happen. A great example is that when the Titanic sunk, some witnesses said it broke in half, others said it went down whole. When they finally found it, they knew it broke in half. Now, nobody f concluded from that, the Titanic didn't sink, it's all a lie. And likewise, I don't think we're quite 
we're necessarily justified in jumping to the conclusion that Dr. Ford's tale isn't true just because some of the details she's given have evolved or changed. Now, the number of false accusations in sexual assault is reportedly very low, 2-7% to 7 according to multiple studies. I'll uh, put a citation for that in the comp down there. Um, but I've heard some reports that this number could be skewed because there are accusations that are not even investigated, so keep that in mind. So the point here is that both of these theories don't really work. So when neither theory fits the facts, the best thing to do is go looking for a third theory or you find some way to amend one of those theories. And to help counterbalance this, here's two theories that are just obviously wrong, and you probably have seen them on the internet. Dr. Ford and or Judge Kavanaugh are victims of a conspiracy by the Republicans, Democrats, or some affiliated group. Dr. Ford gave an account of her allegation in 2012, long before Judge Kavanaugh's hearings. So unless you think the Democrats can see the future or play a long game on every conservative judge, there's no way that's the case. Further, the Republicans control the Senate and the Senate Judiciary Committee. If they'd simply wanted to ignore Dr. Ford, shut her out, deny her the chance to speak, and so on, they really could have easily done so, and no one could have stopped them. The fact that they let her come forward and speak and investigated her claims speaks to the fact that they really are trying to take it seriously, even if you don't like them. Fourth, Dr. Ford made the whole thing up. There's little or no indication that Dr. Ford is a liar. Again, I, minor inconsistencies in her story, changing details, don't show that someone's a liar. It may show that they're wrong. There's very little for her to gain and much for her to lose uh, by doing this. The risk versus reward ratio of making something like this up when the stakes are this high is insane. No sane person is going to do that. And I don't see any evidence that Dr. Ford is insane. Further, some details of her account are unlikely to have been fabricated. Um, you can read her account, both in the letter to Senator Feinstein and the other version she gave. We'll go watch the Senate testimony, read it in the Washington Post. She gives some odd throwaway details, like she did claim that she'd only had one beer, that she was wearing a swimsuit under her clothes, a few other things like that. And peripheral details of accounts like that are much less likely to have been fabricated. Um, you can look that up in historical studies that when somebody makes an offhand comment, there's very little chance that they're making that up. Now here are some good theories. This first one uh, my wife suggested to me, and I've thought about it, and it works on a number of levels. It's that Judge Kevin is guilty, but he can't remember the event because he was blackout drunk when it happened. Now this solves many problems with Theory 1 Simple, as it explains why he believes he's innocent, why so no similar allegations have emerged, and possibly why Mark Judge also denied the event, i.e. if he was also drunk, and Judge Kavanaugh did admit that he drank as a teenager. However, this does not explain the problems with Dr. Ford's changing story, as well as the lack of any other evidence and the denials of the other witnesses. We would still expect there to be some evidence and some other witnesses who could at least point to the plausibility of this, like Dr. Ford's friends saying, oh yeah, there was that event, or something similar to that. And additionally, Judge Kavanaugh did testify under penalty of perjury that he had never been blackout drunk. And while I've never been blackout drunk, I've known many people who have been, and they always know something happened. You don't remember what happened, but you know you're missing time. So if this theory is correct, he committed perjury. So this theory has some problems, but it's still much less problematic than theory one. I'd say it's a pretty good theory. I'd rate it as somewhat plausible. My wife might be onto something with this. Uh, second theory, this is theory 2A. Judge Kavanaugh is innocent, someone else has dealt to Dr. Ford, and Dr. Ford has misremembered or confused the event. Now, this solves some problems with, that Theory 2 has, as it explains why Dr. Ford would come forward against her own self-interest. She really believes Judge Kavanaugh has assaulted her, but she's just getting it wrong. Now, the evolving nature of her accounts, as well as her inability to recall certain events in her testimony before Congress, does point to this as a possibility. It will explain, also explains the lack of other evidence and the denials of the other witnesses. However, why would she single out Judge Kavanaugh as opposed to anyone else? That, um, it doesn't explain that. Additionally, she does place Judge Kavanaugh and Mark Judge together, and the two were friends at the time. If she is misremembering things, then it seems odd that she would get that detail right, while also forgetting and misremembering other things. 
getting this detail right and the inclusion of additional details that are frivolous, like what I'd mentioned before, that suggests that even if she's getting some things wrong, there really is something real behind her story. So this theory is better than just saying he's innocent, full stop, but again, it's not perfect. I think it's pretty good, but it doesn't explain everything. It doesn't quite get us all the way there. But it's still a better explanation than Theory 1 or Theory 2, and I think it's a better explanation than Theory 1A, but maybe some people disagree with me on that. Moving on, uh, there's a fifth theory that I came up with while putting this together. Aspects of both Theory 1A and Theory 2A are true. Judge Cavan is guilty, but he doesn't remember it due to being blackout drunk, and Dr. Ford is misremembering details of the event, possibly due to trauma from the event. Now, this explains almost all the facts. The real only major problem with it is it's not a simple theory. It's actually very complicated and requires the coincidence of both Judge Kavanaugh getting blackout drunk and perjuring himself to Congress and the trauma of making Dr. Ford's memory confused in just the way this has happened. So if this theory is not ad hoc, it certainly does toe the line with being ad hoc. Complex theories that require a coincidence like this one are going to be wrong far more often than they're going to be right. It's kind of it's the same principle you see in engineering. The more complex you make a machine, the more places it has to break. So the more complex your theory is, the more places it has to go wrong. And that's really the major problem with this theory. I brought this up to illustrate the point that you can always find a theory that explains all the facts if you're willing to let it get complicated enough. But complex theories are almost never right. A further point is that if some of Dr. Ford's memory is in doubt, then this casts doubt over her whole recollection of the event. The only real way to trust her memory then would be with corroborating evidence or details, like the fact that she connected Mark Judge and Judge Kavanaugh and we know independently that they were friends and spent time together. And like I said, it requires that he committed perjury before the Senate and for reasons I've cited, I think that's unlikely. But if you want to allow for the possibility that he, Dr. Ford, or any of the other witnesses lied under oath, all this gets much more complicated and you can come up with all kinds of different theories. Now, I think it's unlikely any of them did lie under oath, and none of this get, even gets into the politics involved here or the fact that professionals in the legal field have repeatedly said that there is no legal case here. So now I'd like to look at a different theory, but one that still very much relates to the Judge Kavanaugh hearings. The Democrats have used and abused Dr. Ford to further their own political ends. Now, this theory says nothing about Kavanaugh's guilt or innocence. He could be guilty or innocent, and this theory could be true. And it neatly explains the timelines of events, the actions of Senator Feinstein, and matches up with the statements and even the expressed wishes of some of the Democrats. Senator Feinstein, Representative Eshoo, and possibly people in their offices knew about Dr. Ford's allegations in July. Senator Feinstein did not bring this up in the public or private confirmation hearings. Allowing Kavanaugh to respond to Dr. Ford's allegations in the private hearing would have, at least in theory, preserved Dr. Ford's anonymity. Now, we all know that with the way our government works, it probably would have leaked anyway, but at least you, Senator Feinstein could have said she was making a good, fo a good faith effort. There were six weeks where Senator Feinstein could have brought up these allegations, and there were several ways she could have done so. There are procedures in place for the, in the Senate Judicial Committee to deal with anonymous allegations and things like this that are meant to be kept secured. She did not use them. It was only after the regularly scheduled hearings were completed that the information on, on Dr. Ford's letter leaked to the press. Now, this timing was remarkably convenient for the Democrats wishing to stop Kavanaugh's nomination. And we should always be highly suspicious of press leaks that work in favor of a political party. It was only after the leak that Senator Feinstein confirmed the existence of the allegations and referred the matter to the FBI. Dr. Ford testified under oath that she was unaware that the committee or representatives of it could come to California and interview her there. Now this was communicated to her lawyers and this strongly suggests that her lawyers did not tell her about it. It's kind of a catch-22 where either her lawyers didn't tell her about this or she lied under oath. And Either of those is a big deal and very problematic. And the reason it relates to this theory is that one of her lawyers was recommended to her by Senator Feinstein's office. Now, it was also reported that Dr. Ford's lawyers were issuing bizarre conditions for her testimony and committing to dates and times for the testimony only to back out and change their minds. And it's not clear if this was coming from Dr. Ford, her lawyers, or both. And the reason for this is the 
chaotic and bizarre nature of the reporting that was going on for the 10 days prior to that. Now, the Democrats in the committee and the Senate repeatedly and often called for delays in the process both before and after Dr. Ford's allegations. Many of them refused to participate in the investigations the Republicans did after Dr. Ford's allegations came to light. Just for example, the Chuck Sumer, the Senate Minority Leader, said that he was going to fight Kavanaugh's nomination with everything that he had. Cory Brooker said that anyone who supports Judge Kavanaugh is complicit in evil, and that the confirmation hearings were like walking through the valley of the shadow of death. No hyperbole there, I guess. Now, back in July, Senator Camille Harris said that Judge Brett Kavanaugh represents a direct and fundamental threat to the promise of equality, and that his nomination was an existential threat to the health care of hundreds of millions of Americans. In June, Senator Dick Durbin said that Kavanaugh's hearing should be delayed until 2019. In August, Senator Richard Blumenthal said that Kavanaugh's hearings need to be delayed. On September 20th, and this is after Dr. Ford's allegations were made public, Senator Christian Gillibrand said that Dr. Ford should not testify until after the FBI had completed an investigation, i.e., until after the November elections. And there are many other instances of the Democrats saying things like this on the record, I'll put uh, citations for each one of these that I provided, either in the description or the comments. Now, Dr. Ford testified under oath that neither she nor her lawyers leaked to the press. So that only leaves Senator Feinstein, Representative Eshoo, some people in their offices, and some of Dr. Ford's friends who actually knew about the allegations. Now, I think it's pretty unlikely that Dr. Ford's friends would leak to the press. That's not very friendly behavior. and. There really just doesn't seem to be any motive for them to do that. Why would they do that? They'd be betraying their friend, and it's hard to see how they get anything out of it. Conversely, there is very clear motive, as well as opportunity, for Senator Feinstein, Representative Shu, or their offices to leak to the press. Hence, I think it's pretty likely that this leak came from the Democrats. Now, the actions of Senator Feinstein and other Democrats, both before and after Dr. Ford's allegations became public, virtually guaranteed that Dr. Ford's name would come out to the public and that she would need to testify publicly. If Senator Feinstein and other Democrats had really wanted justice for Dr. Ford, there are many things they could have said and done differently. There are many ways they could have protected her anonymity. The Senate Judiciary Committee, again I'll say it, has procedures in place where that could have been handled. They could have immediately referred it to the FBI or their local law enforcement. They could have basically done almost anything, but they didn't. So if Dr. Ford's allegations are serious enough to warrant involving the FBI now, why didn't Senator Feinstein involve them back in July? This could have been done without making anything public and preserving Dr. Ford's anonymity as she requested in writing. So the idea that the Democrats are pursuing justice here for Dr. Ford just does not explain these facts. It simply does not fit. If most of us were in a position of authority and somebody came to us with similar charges and we wanted to pursue justice for them, we would not act in this fashion. At least we wouldn't if we were good people. Conversely, explaining the timeline of these events by saying that Senator Feinstein and possibly some other people sat on Dr. Ford's allegation until the time when it would be the most likely to delay Judge Kavanaugh's nomination makes an awful lot of sense. That explains it all very easily. Based on Dr. Ford's testimony, the bizarre demands her lawyers made, and the fact that one of her lawyers was recommended by Senator Feinstein's office, it also seems likely that her lawyers were trying to drag things out. The simplest explanation of how the Democrats have treated Dr. Ford's story is that they are using her for political ends. That explains all the facts. It's simple. It's not ad hoc. It doesn't leave us expecting more evidence than we see. And it's entirely plausible because we all know that either political party would do something like this given the chance. Now this says nothing about Judge Kavanaugh's guilt or innocence. This theory can be completely true and he can be guilty or innocent. This theory guarantees that Dr. Ford is a victim. If she was assaulted by Judge Kavanaugh, then she's twice over a victim. He victimized her and then the Democrats did it again. She's a victim of the Democrats abusing in her story for their political ends. And it's perfectly compatible with any of the other theories I've presented here. You know, theories 1, 2, 1A, 2A, and 5 could fit with this Theories three and four don't, but that's okay because they're bad theories anyway. And still, both Judge Kavanaugh and Dr. Ford could be telling the truth. One of them could be lying, or they both could be lying, and this theory still holds up. So, 
I claim that inference to the best explanation shows us that whatever happened, it's not as simple as sa simply saying Kavanaugh is guilty or Kavanaugh is innocent. There are some other aspects that are required to make sense of all these facts. So by my estimation, theory one, that it's simply the case that Kavanaugh is guilty is unlikely. Theory two, that it's simply the case that Kavanaugh is innocent is also unlikely. Theory three, that either Dr. Ford or Judge Kavanaugh are victims of some type of conspiracy is very unlikely. Theory four, that Dr. Ford made the whole thing up is almost impossible. Theory 1A, that Kavanaugh is guilty and doesn't remember it because he was blackout drunk, I think that's plausible. Theory 2A, that someone else assaulted Dr. Ford and she's misremembering the event and T Judge Kavanaugh is innocent, I think that's also plausible. Theory 5, that combines Theory 1A and Theory 2A, that's a bit less plausible because it gets too complicated and hence is unlikely to be true. And Theory 6, that the Democrats have used and abused Dr. Ford's allegations for their own political ends, I'd say that's almost dead certain. I think the only way you can deny that is if you're a partisan who's sticking your fingers in your ears and yelling, I'm not listening. That is absolutely what they did. There is no other reasonable explanation for the way they've behaved. So because of how these theories measure up under inference to the best explanation, theory six is superior to theory 2A, which is superior to theory 1A, which is superior to theory five, which is superior to theory two, which is superior to theory three, superior to theory one, and superior to theory four. And that's one of the things that inference to the best explanation can do. We can measure how good these explanations are, and then from this I can say, theory four is the worst of all of these, and theory six is the best of all of these. So, like the prosecutor and who the Republicans hired said, a he said, she said case is incredibly difficult to prove, but this case is even weaker than that. I think that theories 1A, 2A, and 6 show that it's possible to believe both Dr. Ford and Judge Kavanaugh. There are several ways where they can both be telling the truth. Theory 6 shows with near certainty that the D Democrats have per not pursued justice for Dr. Ford and have instead abused her allegations for their own political ends. Now, I think it's a bit more likely that Judge Kavanaugh is innocent than that he is guilty. The theories that show that he is innocent tend to be a little more plausible than those that show that he's guilty, and there's really just more ways that he could be innocent than there is that he could be guilty here. But there's no proof either way, so it remains possible that he is guilty. This is reinforced by inference to the best explanation analysis, which demonstrates, I claim, that the explanations where Kavanaugh is innocent simply explain the facts better than those that say he's guilty. Now, you disagree with me, you know, do you think it's more likely that he's guilty, or, you know, you're one of those people who I just called a partisan with your fingers in the ear, your ears and you don't think the Democrats did anything like I claim in Theory 6? Well, I suggest you run your own inference to the best explanation analysis. Lay out all the facts you can find, find a theory or two that explains all, all those facts, and is simple, not ad hoc, and it doesn't leave us expecting evidence that we don't see, and maybe you'll find a better theory than I have here. And you know, one of the great things about using inference to the best explanation is, as soon as you get more information, more facts, or those change, you can just do it again. So like, as I'm finishing this up today, it's being reported that Dr. Ford may have committed perjury in, to the Senate in relation to the testimony about her polygraph. Now, I think it's pretty likely this is going to turn out to be yet another non-story due to the high level of chaos that relates to the reporting around these hearings. But suppose it turned out to be true, well, I just add that to the list of facts I have and then run it again and see what I come up with. So, disagree? I suggest you do one of these yourself and let me know where it comes up. So I hope this has shown you how inference to the best explanation is very, very useful. We can use it to explore a lot of things that are difficult to get at, and it is very good at showing us which theories are good, which ones are poor, and which ones are really outlandish and flat out stupid. So any questions or comments, just leave them and I'll get back to you. Thanks.